Why does a two-stroke engine rev higher when the fuel-to-air ratio is leaner, meaning less fuel, when you would think that less fuel would mean that there's less available to sustain higher engine revs? Well, in this video, you're going to find out why this is actually the case and why running an engine like this is not a good idea. And you will also see what can cause this situation unwittingly and the types of damage it can cause to your engine. And there'll be some solutions if you find that your engine is running this way. As always, I'm going to throw a little bit of detail in there for a better understanding. Welcome to the Repair Specialist channel. I'm Craig, the owner and creator. And having been in the trade for around 30 years, I now make videos relating to the diagnosis and repair of small engines and machinery, and how things work and why. And in layman's terms, using clear visual explanations to help you gain a deeper understanding and a firmer knowledge base. Why? Because knowledge is power. So let's get to it. And supporting this video is a free download leaflet of how to tune your chainsaw. There's a link in the description below that will take you onto my website where you can download this, as I've said, completely free. The best of it is, is it's printable and you can take it into your workspace with you and tune your chainsaw at your leisure. OK, so to answer this successfully, we need to go through what the meaning of lean fueling actually is. So to keep this simple, when the engine starts to move, air is drawn in through the induction tube and as it does so, it draws out fuel from the main jet and it mixes with the air in a process called atomization. But it's the ratio between the air and fuel within this mixture that's the key player here. If the constitution of this air and fuel has to be just right in order for the engine to run correctly, then all that lean fueling means is that there's too little fuel inside this fuel to air mixture for the engine to run correctly. And on the opposite end of the scale, if there's too much fuel in there compared to air, then the fueling is rich. And rich fueling, of course, is inefficient for an engine. The engine will struggle to combust any increased amount of fuel that comes in. And the more it increases, the more it struggles in kind of a linear effect. So then, if we say that the fueling is too rich and the engine won't run efficiently, won't rev up to its maximum, instead it lags. Can we say the same about lean fueling? Well, lean fueling is actually quite different. And why is it different? Well, we'll take what's considered an optimal amount of fuel in this mixture to run this engine, and the engine will sound like this. And from there on, start to make the mixture leaner, then what you'll tend to find is, instead of the engine revs lowering, they actually start to increase, to the point where the engine seems to have far more power. Why did removing some of this fuel make the engine run much harder and faster? Well, the considered optimal amount of air and fuel that we've been talking about to run the engine isn't actually the most ideal ratio for the most efficient combustion possible within the engine. In other words, the engine can't combust this level of air to fuel mixture completely efficiently. And that's why I called it the considered optimal amount of air to fuel mixture. And I'll go on to explain why this is considered the optimal very shortly. But from this level of air to fuel mixture, Removing some of this fuel means that it's becoming more of a level of fuel in there that the engine can combust more and more efficiently the leaner it gets. And that's why the engine revs raise as the fuel is getting leaner. Until, of course, it gets to the point where there's so little fuel in there, there just isn't enough for efficient combustion at all. And then the engine revs lower. So why then are the carburettors set to the considered optimal amount that doesn't combust all of the fuel as efficiently as when it does in that lean state? Why don't we actually set it in that lean state 
where we're combusting most if not all of the fuel and we're getting higher engine revs and power. Well, as I've already said, running the machine like this is not actually a very good idea. And the reason it's not a good idea is something to do with the availability of the two-stroke fuel itself. Because mixed in with the two-stroke fuel is of course the lubricating two-stroke oil. And ideally we want a good optimal level of this oil to go through the engine to of course lubricate it to run well and to allow the engine longevity. And so a compromise has to be met to allow enough of this two-stroke fuel mix to go through the engine but at the same time not too much to prevent the engine from running well. And so on the other side of the coin we also want this engine to run as powerful and efficiently as it possibly can without any damage or seizure of the components. And so firstly that's where the considered optimal amount of fuel comes in because this amount of air to fuel ratio is considered to be an amount that can lubricate the engine and at the same time allow the engine to run well. Yes, it's not efficiently combusting all of the fuel and oil, but it's adjusted purposely in this way to allow longevity overall to the engine. At the same time, as I've mentioned, the engine does run well. If we look at the fuel mix when the engine is running like this, at a maximum, with seemingly more power, then you'll see that there's far less lubricating oil going through the engine because there's less fuel going through the engine. And that's a double problem because we've got less oil going through the engine and the engine is running maxed out. Running the engine at this level, of course, will put stress on all components and at the same time, having less oil in there, we're going to see less longevity of this engine. And of course, we might think it's tempting to put more and more fuel in there by adjusting the carburetor so more fuel goes in and more oil goes in to allow the engine maximum lubrication. But as we've already seen, if we go too far by putting too much fuel in there, it goes too rich and the engine becomes less efficient and the engine revs decrease. As well as that, it will coke the engine with carbon and the spark plug will have to be replaced more often. And that furthers the need to ensure that the carburetor is always set correctly to this optimal amount of air to fuel ratio to allow efficient lubrication and for the engine to run well for many years. We can see the damage that lean fueling can produce by looking at this piston. You can see the wear marks on the piston there where it's got too hot because of a lack of two stroke fuel with its oil getting through the engine and that's caused overheating and metal transfer. We see it as this scoring and this wear. So now we've established what lean fueling actually is and now we realize that even though it seems like the engine is running more powerful whilst lean fueling, it's not the way to run an engine for longevity. And so at this stage then, it's obvious that incorrect fuel to air mixture settings can cause this kind of lean fueling problem. But that's not the only cause. There are other things that can go wrong with the engine and the carburetor that can cause lean fueling unwittingly. So what I'm going to do now is quickly list some other causes and some solutions. OK, so far we've looked at lean fueling as being a fuel problem in as much that there's less fuel available from the main jet entering the induction tube of the carburetor, making it so that the fuel to air ratio within the atomized mix is too lean for the engine to run on when we compare it to what we consider optimal. But sometimes the carburetor can be working absolutely fine, so it's not a fuel issue. Sometimes it can be an issue where the carburetor or the engine is drawing in too much air from a different place other than the induction tube. We've got air and fuel mixture that comes in through the inlet. This is after the carburetor. And as the piston goes up, it draws the air fuel mixture underneath it. And then without going into too much detail, that mixture is then taken to the top of the piston and used for combustion. And in order to achieve that, all of these areas here have to be totally airtight to keep that mixture in with no leaks whatsoever. 
But the barrel gasket sits somewhere here, and that's at the split junction between the barrel and the crankcase beneath it. These can be made from like a papery, cardboardy type material, sometimes a metal, and it's vital that these gaskets are in good order, because if they're not, then each time the piston goes up to draw in air fuel mixture, it can also draw in air if there's any damage around that gasket. And any extra air, as you can see coming in there, upsets that air fuel mixture, and we've got too much air in now, making the fuel mixture weak. We'd get the same problem, by the way, if the bolts were loose that held the crankcase to the barrel. There is a lot more work involved in replacing these gaskets. So before you go stripping the engine right down, it's best to be sure that it is this gasket. And the main seals, of course, are here, and it's where the crankshaft sticks out of the crankcase. So I'll turn this engine round so we can see this face. I've got the crankshaft here sticking out the crankcase. The job of the crank seal is to keep an airtight seal there on the shaft. And it prevents this vital fuel air mixture from escaping, but also it prevents any air being drawn in in that area. And if those seals aren't working correctly or they're damaged in any way, it can draw into the crankcase. We know what that's going to do. There's going to end up being too much air there to fuel. Of course, there is a fix for this, but it's not a simple one. Generally, the engine has to be stripped down to replace these and it's always recommended that the bearings behind them are changed at the same time because what can quite often happen is that when the seals degrade it's because the bearings have degraded and there's up and down movement in the crankshaft and that's what's pushed against the seals and damaged them. So this kind of work might have to be undertaken by a professional because the engine has to be stripped down and the crankcase has to be parted. It's about as large as a job gets on a two-stroke engine. And I have found this particular issue a little more common in the past. I've had this quite a few times. Now the inlet manifold sits between the carburetor here and the engine. And on this side there's generally a gasket between it and the carburetor. And it's the same story on the other side. Now one problem that can arise is when the retaining bolt is loose and we get gaps between the gaskets. And because of that, there's too much air here. Now, it's a weak fuel mixture. Just make sure these bolts are nice and tight. The next thing I'd check are the manifold gaskets. If this gasket's damaged, then air can be drawn in once again. Either gasket could fail, by the way. The manifolds sometimes themselves can be damaged and draw in air. And the problems with that are the same as what we've already seen. Although we've covered fueling, it is important to make sure that the fuel lines are nice and clean, that the fuel filter's not blocked, and that the fuel vanes within the carburetor are all nice and clear. Sometimes, small two-stroke carburetors like those on chainsaws have a screen filter within the carburetor and it's quite common to see this blocked. And this can cause a lack of fuel and lean fueling, depending on how badly blocked it is. These screen filters can be replaced and they're available within carburetor overall kits. Okay, so I've just covered a few of the basic causes. I haven't covered all causes, but what I've mentioned are some of what I've experienced. Okay, so don't forget to take advantage of the RepairSpecialistOnline.com website where from the landing page you can click this button here, free printable downloads, onto the download page and you can see I've got six free downloads here. The best of them are that they're printable and you can take them into your workspace with you and they're on several different topics. We have one on lawnmower ignition coil care, a checklist. The Briggs & Stratton Diaphragm Replacement Guide One Flood Your Chainsaw Without or With Tools How to Order the Correct Chain Every Time for Your Chainsaw How to Tune a Chainsaw Guide and A Chainsaw Won't Run As I've said, they're absolutely free and the download buttons are in the gold and if I just take you through the process because I've been asked this question, how you do this so click free, download Scroll down, add to cart, then view cart, 
then get my download. You can see here, it's absolutely free. There's no payment at all. So get my free download. For the phone number, you may just use any number. I don't need the phone number, but we do need an email address. Okay, so I've filled that in, my name, last name, and email address, and click. And as you can see, we're still here, I have no charge, and place order. And then we come to this screen here, thank you, and your name, and then it says download. Click download, and off it goes onto your PC. So a really big thank you for coming to the end of this video, and I hope you've gained something from it. Thank you for watching.